Hi, everyone. Welcome to this Wednesday, 5 p.m. edition of Home Cooking with Foodland. We're so glad to have you here. Um, FYI, if you hear something in the background, it's the neighbor's lawnmower. And that is proof that we're actually shooting this from my house. Uh, a couple things, you know, we keep trying to make the show better and better. And so we have mics today and, I'm, and I really hope that um, they really help with the sound here. Um, if you are having issues with hearing, please shoot us a, a note in the Q&A feature here that, so that we can try to address it and make sure that it's better for you folks. Um, you know, we're looking forward to this evening's class and we'll be doing Kahlua pork sliders or Kahlua pork sandwiches with a really cool barbecue sauce. And we got an Asian slaw. We're gonna make a kind of a nice uh, corn and avocado salad. Um, really, really, really delicious. And maybe not the traditional thing you think of for local style um, 4th of July, but I think would, would blend well very much to if you did, you know, kalbi or steaks or whatever you normally do with poke, it, it's all gonna work together. Um, the fun thing about the dishes tonight too is they all work by themselves. So you could make the, the avocado salad and, and send it to a, a, a get together and it works great. It's also really good in burritos. The slaw is great as a salad by itself. The slaw is great on the sandwich. You can take the Kulo pig and the sauce, make it together and serve that as a dish on rice. Really, really good. Or you could just do the Kulo pig with uh, buns and have a really nice sandwich. So really versatile. I, I like to think that I'm hopefully going to show you how to do three or four things that you can add to your repertoire and you can use them on, on a lot of different ways. So um, with that, I'm trying to think if there's anything else we want to talk about. Let's go ahead and get started. We're going to start. Oh, question. Cheryl has a question. Oh, never mind. She's just waving at me because she's so happy to see me. Um, we're going to start with the sauce here, and uh, let's 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 come on this side here real quick. Okay. So, by the way, I, I thought I'd tell you, I wanted to keep it a little bit light today. There's a lot of knife work and more cold work because two weeks in a row I decided. Well, you know, two weeks ago my gas went out, and then last week I showed you guys how to deal with catching your pan on fire. I wanted to just like take it light this time. Okay. So I have a pan that is lightly heating right now, and we're gonna get a sauce going. And we're making barbecue sauce. And so barbecue sauce, the key about barbecue, barbecue sauce is really it's tomato product, usually sugar, vinegar, and those are the bases in there. Now you can add things to get more character and more you know, dimension, but it's sweet, tart, tomato-based kind of a sauce. And people make them, and you don't have to cook them, but the one I'm gonna show you involves cooking, and the specific reason I wanted to show you cooking one is because by cooking, you're adding, uh, you're allowing the flavors to come together, you're adding complexity, and in this case, you're also gonna get a little bit of reduction, which helps make the sauce sticky. So the first thing we're gonna do is cut some uh, onion here, and I am using a red onion. I know that the recipe says white onion, but I figured I'm using half of the onion for the sauce, and I'll use the other half for the salad, and then I'll just use up one onion. So if you're following along, you can do that with me. If not, you can be a purist and go red and white. Okay, so onion's gonna go in. I'm gonna just cut half of this. I'm gonna save the other half for later. Again, we're gonna go ahead and cut some, we're gonna peel off the skin, the outer skin, to get to the, the edible fleshy part. And again, I've kept the stem on. Trim this dry, this dry part, I'm gonna trim it off. And in this case, I want, I want small, small pieces of onion because the goal would be to actually let them kind of melt inside to the sauce. And so to do that, I'm going to, I'll show you, I'll, I'll flip this around, but I'm taking very thin slices across the onion. I'm going to go maybe three times, not all the way to the stem, like that. So you can see my three cuts. Then I'm going to take my knife and I'm going to come down here and cut it straight down. Close to the stem, but not all the way to. Again, like that, we have the whole onion still together. And like we show, I showed you before, right? Cooking, cutting technique, thumb behind, these fingers behind, this is your lead guide finger. Knife is gonna go against here. That's why you can, you can continually, you don't actually have to look what you're doing because that guide finger keeps it going. So my hands over here, like I told, said, and we're just gonna let the knife guide down. And if you're not really, if this is something that you're still getting used to, speed is not important. Technique is important. Get the technique right, speed comes secondarily, okay? 
going to go ahead and trim it down a little bit more on both sides here. We'll cut a little bit more here so I can try to zip all of the onion here. And then we just have the stem that's left. So here's our, our diced onion. I've got some garlic here. I'm going to cut the stems off. These are cloves that were pre-peeled. Cut the ends off here. Now again, you could go and slice them and mince them. Let's see if I have my, I'm going to grab my, my trusty cleaver. We're going to go ahead and lean into them to keep it fast, right? We're going to go ahead and push down, push down, push down. What do you down. think about pre? What do you think about pre-peeled Chop. garlic? I love pre-peeled garlic. I mean, you know, once when you start cooking and you cook a lot, and you, you're always having to make decisions about time, money, and convenience. And so, you know, I think pre-peeled garlic is great. Is it going to be as good as taking a garlic clove and then peeling it and chopping it? No. But is the trade-off worth it? Yes, um, you're still gonna get great flavor. What I do though is when I buy the pre-peeled garlic cloves, I open the package completely and then I put it in a container with a paper towel. And what that does is it really helps keep the, um, the, the cloves dry. If they're all sitting in moisture together, gradually what might happen is the, um, the, 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 the clothes will start to like get wet and they might start to pickle in there. So I keep them dry, I keep rolling them around and I keep that paper towel in there to help absorb the moisture which keeps them dry. You hear that, don't you? But we'll pretend that we don't hear anything, okay? All okay, right, so, what's the difference between red and yellow onion while you're moving Yeah, the around? difference between red and yellow onion is, um, they're just, they're varietal differences. A red onion is gonna be a little bit sweeter than a, just a regular Spanish onion. Um, but not quite as sweet as like a Vidalia or a Maui onion. And they add, it adds beautiful color. So like for, for example, I could take a red onion here. Um, I'm trying to make sure that I don't have the same thing like last week happened. If I took a red onion here and I put vinegar in it, it would actually come a really bright red. So there, there's some flavor differences, but there's also visual differences and those matter a lot in cooking for us. Okay, so I've got my, um, my pan that's, been preheating and I'm adding my, I'm adding grapeseed oil. We're adding it to the bottom and you can see it's nicely coated right now. And you see, see that? I, you see the sizzling, which is great. I'm gonna go ahead and add in the garlic. And you hear that sound? Remember cooking is visual, it's smell and it's sound. And that sizzling is what I'm looking at. I really wanna hear. We'll add the onions now. Swirl it a little bit. If you were here, you could smell the garlic and the onions. Very fragrant, very delicious. We're gonna stir a little bit here. Now, cooking is also about feel. It looks a little dry to me, so I'm gonna add just a little bit more fat because I want all of my onions and garlic to be nicely coated so that it can really sweat. Now, what I'm doing here is the term is sweating. If it was hotter, I would be sauteing. I just want a very low sound because what I'm trying to do is lightly cook it without getting too much color on it. And as you can see all the steam, the steam is all the moisture that's coming out. So we're, we're starting to really get this onion and garlic to be mild and all of the flavors, the essential oils are coming out into the neutral flavored uh, grapeseed oil that I put in here. Okay, it's very, it's, now there's, not a whole lot of sound, a lot of the water's coming out. You'll start to see the steam start to dissipate. And we'll let that go. While it's, while it's doing that, I'm gonna start working on getting the next uh, ingredients that are gonna go into the, the sauce here. So next we're gonna put in hoisin sauce. I'm using Lee Kum Ki. You know, you can go ahead and use whatever favorite hoisin sauce that you have, um, about two thirds cup. And one of the things about barbecue sauce, the thing about tonight's cooking is you don't have to be super precise. It's all about feel. So. I'm gonna put two thirds cup in here. Two thirds of two thirds of a chef's judgment cup. We'll cover that here. We'll get that going here. Stir that in quickly. Next thing we're gonna put in is ketchup. And by the way, as it pertains to ketchups, 
one of the ones, you know, we talked about preferences and my preference is I like to use Heinz and the reason I like Heinz is because it has a very vis a certain viscosity that I like in the cooking. You can use whatever ketchup you like, um, but I do really like the viscosity that this provides. So we got two thirds of hoisin sauce in here, half a cup of ketchup, we're gonna go one fourth, one fourth, that's a half a cup. And then we're gonna put some honey in here. I'm using a really kind of a fun honey that I found in our store today. This is from Kauai. It's wildflower blossom honey that we're gonna put in here now, uh, about a quarter cup. So we're gonna go, that's a quarter cup. What do you think about vegetarian version of hoisin sauce? You know, that's a good, I don't even know, I don't even know if they're vegetarian version. I think this is vegetarian, isn't it? Let's see what's in here. Soybean paste, potato powder, caramel, modified cornstarch. I believe this is vegetarian. There's no fish or anything in here. At least what I can tell in here. So I think you're good if you just use this as is. Okay. Um, so we've got that in there. Honey's in there. We're going to put some shoyu, two tablespoons. One, two, and we'll put a little bit of sriracha. We're going to put a tablespoon. One. I believe, as I think about all the ingredients that are in here, we are working with a vegetarian product. It is not gluten free because I use shoyu, but um, there is no there's no meat product in here. So we're gonna let this cook slowly, okay? And I'm gonna turn this down to low. What you wanna do is you wanna go very slow and low so that all the flavors can come together. If it starts to get too thick, you can put a little bit of um, of water in here to loosen it up again. But if it gets too thick, you run the risk of burning. But I think you're, you'll be okay. And you see how the bubbles are? The very slow, lazy bubble, that's what you're looking for. Okay, and now you're gonna let all the flavors to come together. Now, if you like a sweeter sauce, you can add, oh, sorry, rice wine vinegar, one third cup, boom. Now look at the viscosity. I was wondering why it looks thick. There you go. This looks good now. Rice wine vinegar. So you're gonna have acidity from the vinegar, sweetness from the poison and the honey and some of it from the ketchup. You got a tomato in there, a little spice from the um, sriracha, and then you also have that umami from the shoyu. Um, now we're gonna let this do its thing. We let it kind of like cook slowly. I wanna show you here real quickly. Um, this is a Kahlua pig that I have warm, ready to go. And you know, they're really good. You can make your own and I love making my own, but you can also get really good varieties at a store. You know, we have some great partners. We've got Ono Ono Foods, we've got our friends Kyoki's and of course Maze, all really great products. So whichever one you like, go for. Um, the next thing I wanna get going is the Asian slaw. And so what I'm gonna do first is we're gonna kinda make what is the base of the sauce and then we're gonna add all of the vegetables in it and we're gonna kinda stir it together. So um, I have a big bowl here and on average, and about we're gonna put maybe, maybe six cups and you want a bowl that is much bigger then it's gonna hold the product in there. And the reason why is you're gonna to wanna to stir it and you need the space to move around. I think you know a lot of people will say, oh, I'm just gonna, here, I'm gonna make my slaw in a bowl like this. And then you're like trying to like stir it and it's all falling out. Go for the bigger bowl because you can always transfer it into the smaller bowl when you're done. Okay, so mayonnaise, our, our good friend, best foods, right? We're gonna put it in there, two thirds cup. Oh, sorry, I'm gonna eyeball this again. So that's about one third. That's about two thirds cup. We're gonna go in there. Can you explain to us what umami means again? Yeah, umami is like word? my favorite word. I think it sounds super cool. Um, but it really, it, it refers to what is, what is known as the third, I'm sorry, the fifth taste. And so, you know, when I was starting cooking, they were teaching that you could only taste in your palate would be sweet, sour, salty, and bitter. And everything else that you, 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 you get in flavor is from smell. And that you're, what you perceive as taste is a combination of those four things plus what you're smelling in your olfactory sense in your nose. And then the Japanese had, have a term and it was called umami and they called it the fifth taste. And really what that refers to is the sense of savory quality. So when you think of eating, when you eat miso soup or when you eat a really rich broth that has maybe mushrooms in it or but what, what Parmesan cheese adds to a Caesar salad, it's a very meaty, savory quality 
Um, and that's what umami refers to. So that's who word, and that's what you're looking for when you cook a lot. Um, so we've got our mayo in here, rice wine vinegar we're gonna put in there. We're gonna put a splash, in, and what we're doing is we're making the basis of what a creamy coleslaw dressing is. A creamy coleslaw dressing, if you're gonna make one on your own and you're like on the fly, it's mayonnaise or sour cream or a combination of the two, something sweet, so it could be, yes. I dropped out. Your mic dropped. Can you hear me now? Sorry, everyone. No. How about now? Let me let me do it. Here's a technical check. Here. Can you see the light on? Lights on or off? I think we're fine. It's on. So it's up. We're off. Okay. We're gonna make a quick check here. We're gonna make a quick change. I'm gonna put on this mic here. Good. Okay. So we were talking about. Um, coleslaw dressing. So uh, the, the classic coleslaw dressing typically is mayonnaise or mayonnaise and sour cream or just sour cream. It needs something tart. So vinegar, pineapple juice, lemon juice, lime juice, and then sweet. So that sweetness would be come from sugar, honey, agave. If you have those three things and some salt and pepper, that's a creamy dressing base that you have. And then you can add cabbage and whatever you want to make the slaw. So in this case, we've got our mayonnaise in here. We're gonna put uh, rice wine vinegar, which is a nice mild vinegar, not harsh, right? A little bit of sugar. We have some, I have, okay, so here, Mrs. Toda, um, I have the recipe, it says toasted sesame oil. And so what I mean by that is, is the stuff that we use here, it is already toasted and that's why it's brown. And the reason I start, I've started to say that when my recipes is because I went to a, a cooking competition in the mainland and I wrote the recipe and I said sesame oil. And when I got there and they provide all the ingredients, um, it was actually sesame seeds that had been pressed and it was just clear, unflavored. And I was freaking out because I needed this stuff here. So I was trying to explain to them what I was looking for. And they came back to me and they said, oh, you mean toasted sesame oil? And um, anyway, they found me this stuff in an Asian market, but in the mainland, this is, is this not, it, there's, a difference, there's a difference between the two. So in Hawaii, if I say toasted sesame oil, I mean the stuff that we use to make poke and do all our Asian cooking, okay? Long story short. Um, so show you one inside there. Last thing uh, I'm gonna do is go ahead and we're gonna quickly mix this together. And we'll let that sit. Now we're gonna start adding all of our vegetables, but I'm gonna check our, our sauce to make sure it's okay real quick. You wanna come take a look at this here? See how it's bubbling? You see the color got darker too? Really looking really good. It's really coming together nicely. So we'll just let it do its thing. It's looking good. Um, and we'll come back over here. All right, so we're gonna add some ginger now. Um, we're going to add a tablespoon roughly. So I showed you this before, but for, for those of you that maybe weren't here in the last the episode I did this, we're gonna go ahead and peel it with a spoon because it really gets the skin off, but then it doesn't, you don't have all that waste, right? So you have that skin there, it smells really good. The smell of the ginger and the hoisin barbecue sauce in here and the toasted sesame seed oil it's smelling really, really nice. Okay, I'm gonna, I have a little dry piece here, so I'm gonna trim that off. I'm gonna trim this piece off here. That's about the piece I'm looking for to use here. Okay, then I'm gonna get my two favorite tools, my Chinese cleaver and my chef knife. We'll do a quick wipe here. First thing I'm gonna do is smash the ginger. And then I'm gonna go in here. You can use the cleaver or you can use your knife here. But now that I see I have all the fibers kind of like flattened out, what I'm gonna do is if I go, now that I'm going this way, I'm cutting against all of those fibers. Now, if I was gonna make soup or long rice, I would probably be okay with that. But because I'm gonna be making this for a slaw that people are gonna be eating this raw, I really wanna try to make it finer. 
So we're going to really get in there and chop it up. You know, if you're thinking about, if you're wondering if it, if you can use dry ground ginger, I mean, you can, but I think the flavor really changes when you dry ginger versus using fresh. Um, dry ginger is great for baking. Baking, it's a baking spice in my in my head. Um, for Asian flavor profiles, I think you really got to stick with the fresh. So again, we're gonna go and we have chopped it nice and fine, and then we're gonna go ahead and add that to our dressing here. What cooking competition were you in? Um, the competition, the particular one that I was in for that I had the the uh, the sesame oil issue was. It was a con contest called the Supermarket Chef Showdown. I think that was in like 2012. And I had this, this dish that was like, I made this sort of like a riff on um, spicy California ahi poke and I deconstructed it. And so I needed this, I needed that to make the sauce. And that's where it was really getting wonky. It was in Chicago. It was, pretty, it was really fun. Did you win? I did win. I won that, I won that one and then I was able to compete Again, I didn't win the top prize. I won my category, but uh, the one I did win was the, the inaugural one, which was, was really fun. It was really, it was really, I think we were really happy that we were able to win that one. Okay, so I've got all of my dressing stuff in there. I have pre-cut some of this so that we can keep this thing moving. Um, so this is a wambok here. This was a whole head. I cut it in half. I already cut one quarter of that here, but I wanted to show you. So what I did was, you can envision the whole thing. I cut it in half, boom. And then you see the core here? I took my knife and I cut the core out and that's why I ended up, I ended up with this piece here. We wanted about six cups. This is pretty close. I don't know, maybe it's four cups. So I'm gonna take a little bit of the, uh, take a little bit more just so we can do some cutting, some knife work here. And I'm gonna slice it up. Got my knife here, holding it here, cutting it at an angle or a bias, cutting it thin. You can totally grate the ginger, and if you have a grater, go for it. Um, you know, and if you have the one, the Japanese one that you use to like really make the fine stuff for uh, like um, oxtail soup, that works great too. If you have one, please use it. I don't, I don't have one, so, but yeah, you can. And I, when I'm cooking, I try to minimize the tools so that I have less. I have, well, see, I don't cook, I don't clean all the dishes. My wife does, so I try to minimize what Sharon has to clean. So. Um, We've got all that going here. I'm gonna add this in now. If you have cabbage, cabbage would work. Watercress would work. Anything really kind of sturdy and hearty would work to make this slaw, okay? Red cabbage would work too. So, you know, feel free to use what you have or what you, what you can find in this. I did this, I did one buck for this one, but again, you can use your creativity on that. We're gonna add some um, carrot julienne. And when I did this one last week, a lot of, a lot of questions about this. So. This is a Kun peeler. It's called a julienne peeler. There are many brands out there. You can get them. It makes julienning easy. Um, it's super. I, how do you spell that? Which one? The, the brand? K-U-H-N. R-I-K-O-N. Kun Ricon. It's made in Switzerland. But there are, like I said, there are a lot of brands out there. Um, but this one, this brand is a, this brand is, I would say most kitchen cooks use. So this goes in here for color, a little bit of sweetness. And I'm going to add a little bit more. What was your prize that you won for winning supermarket chef? Um, I got bragging rights for 365 days. No, I think I, I'm trying to remember what I got. I think I got, I got a little, um, some cooking stuff. I got. I got a little bit of money. I think, um, shoot, one of the episodes I got to be in the Hallmark Channel on, on something. And one of the one I won was for, I got to be in the Hallmark Channel. And the, I'm trying to remember what, what I got from, it was so long ago. I, I'm getting so old. Um, but yeah, sorry. Um, I got an apron from, from a sponsor, I think too, and a ton of barbecue sauces and stuff. So it was fun. Um, green onions. I also got to be in the news. I got to be on the radio too. That was fun. Okay, so we're gonna add, we have our green onions. We're gonna slice these a quarter cup. Don't forget, dry these out, plant them in your yard. Okay, now I could go like this and cut, 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 cut. And that's like, 
when you think about efficiency, like that's like, I don't know, 50 cuts. I'll be right back. Sauce is looking good. What I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna cut it in half and I'm gonna cut my, and then bring them together so that I have less cutting to do. Then we're gonna go ahead and slice. But cooking competitions are, are really fun. I mean, you know, they're stressful, but I think, you know, you get a chance to express your creativity and feel like you're under pressure and, you know, put yourself out there. The cool part was just getting it to travel to Chicago to the McCormick Center. That was nice. The green onions are going to go in here. And remember, this whole dish so far is, is by feel. I'm not measuring anything, okay? If you feel like you need to measure, please, please do so. Don't hesitate to do that. And as you get more comfortable with cooking, you can eyeball stuff. I don't, like if I was baking, I would measure. But this kind of cooking, you can use, you can go by feel. So we'll add some uh, test sesame seeds here. And then we're going to mix it. Now, one thing about a, a slaw, right, is once you mix your slaw and you make one, the, the sugar and the salt that's in here is going to technically start to draw the moisture out of the vegetables. And so one thing you need to know is if you like a very crisp slaw, then you're really going to want to make it as close to when everyone's going to eat it as possible. Now, if you like it to be a little bit more wet, then you can absolutely coat it earlier. Let it sit in the refrigerator. And again, like when you're cooking, right? Cooking is about, it's about judgment. And so it's nicely coated. I think it needs a little bit of my, my friend best foods here. So I'm going to put a little bit more in here. And because I'm putting a little bit more, right? I need to adjust. So I'm going to put a little bit more rice wine vinegar. Just a splash. I feel like, um, you know, that it just needed a little bit more sheen and a little bit more coating. I'm also going to put a little bit more sesame seeds in here because I think that's really what's going to add flavor, texture, color. And if you really like onion, you know, you're welcome. You could totally put more green onions in here. If you wanted to, you could put cilantro. You know, one thing that I hadn't thought about that could work here too is if you took like Asian pear or pears and make a very fine julienne, you could add it in here. So, you know, again, the, the cooking that I'm trying to show you are really good foundational things where, you know, when you start to, you start with this and then you think about the things that you like and you think about things that you enjoy and then you continue to evolve the flavors that you're doing here. And then you start with a base, it's like having vanilla ice cream and then you add different sauces and you have different all new flavors. And so that's how you take maybe five dishes that you know how to make, but then you can spring them on to make, suddenly you're making like 50 or hundred different dishes. And that's kind of what we do a lot in, in the restaurants. So here's our slaw. Would you add some of that red onion to your slaw? You know, you could totally add red onion. That would work great. Um, I, red onion works great if you like that. I, and as I thought about the rest, and maybe this is intuitive for me, the, the, what I tried to think about when I made the three recipes for you today is, is minimizing the repetition. There's a certain amount of repetition that I think makes sense of across the dishes because it helps to bring all the flavors together, a common theme. But I also try not to repeat too much too because that becomes just repetitive on your palate. And so the, the salsa that, or the sauce salad, this avocado salad we're getting ready to do has red onion in it. I also happened to put some in the sauce already and I know it wasn't originally in there, but it's already in two dishes. So I wouldn't put it in here necessarily, but you totally could. And if I was going to do this by itself, great, perfect. Okay. Um, so now we're going to make the salad, the corn salad. Um, for starters, I already, I kind of got the avocados going. This is, there was four I'm putting in here. I'm going to do two more to show you guys. Um, and if you're really good at avocados, that's awesome. But I think people tend to be interested on the how to do the avocado thing. First of all, picking an avocado. I like these. Um, these are Haas and what you can tell they're right because they're all kind of black. Um, and when you feel them, you want it to have slight give, but you don't want it to be complete soft and you don't want it to be really hard. These are starting to give. If I pushed really hard, I would dent it. The other way you can check is you see this, this uh, part of the stem, I guess you can call it the pico. If I push it out, it's going to come out very easily. And that means to me that it's done. Okay. 
So now that I'm happy with this, we're gonna go ahead and kind of get it ready to go in the salad. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the avocado, hold it flat, and I'm gonna take my knife, and I'm gonna cut around the pit. And then I'm going to take my avocado and unscrew it. Now you have this pit here. What you're gonna to wanna to do is you're gonna take your knife and you're gonna drop it. Just let the natural weight of the knife fall onto the pit. And now it's holding the pit. You're gonna twist and you're gonna pop the pit out like that. So now you have two really nice halves to work with. Then you take you can take a butter knife or a paring knife. I'm gonna use my utility knife and you're gonna score it. And you're actually gonna score it. The skin is thick, so it'll naturally tell the knife when to stop. As you can see, I'm pushing through, right? But I'm not going through the skin. And I'm trying to determine, I'm cutting a grid roughly the size that I want my dice to be. And then I'm taking a spoon and I'm gonna scoop it roughly the size, the width of my dice that I want. So that's what I want. Okay. We noticed that you don't taste your food while you're cooking. And so would you often taste your food to see if you need to add more seasoning? You know, the, the dip I taste a lot and the familiarity, the more familiar I am with the dish, the more I taste, uh, the less I taste, the less familiar I am with the dish, the more I taste. Um, and over time you start to get a sense of when things are right. But you, you're at, that's a very good question, um, and I highly recommend tasting because, you know, we've talked about this in other cooking classes. Is the only way that we know and how the food is by experiencing it. And so, tasting is very important. You you jump you 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 got me before I was gonna taste, but that is a very good question, and I highly recommend tasting. So every um, so we'll do this again. Take the stem out. Do you ever refrigerate your avocados to prevent overripe? Yeah, that's a good, that's another good question that's, that's highly debated. I will. Um, sometimes I, you know, the tricky thing is you buy avocados that are really hard and then they're ready to eat, but you're not ready to eat them. And if you just let them sit, they're just going to keep getting softer and they will turn black. I will, I've put avocados in the refrigerator. Um, and it's because I just, it's just the nature of it. If, if, I, if I could get away with timing it so that they're perfectly ready at, when I'm ready, then I wouldn't, but I, I do. I mean, tomatoes is another one. You know, people ask, you, you're not supposed to refrigerate tomatoes, um, but when tomato is really, really ripe and I'm not ready to eat it, I will put them in the refrigerator. Do you ever put anything on your avocado to prevent it from browning? I guess kind of like apples maybe? Okay, that's a really good question. Let me just finish thing here. So um, what prevents an avocado, so what, what causes the browning is oxidation. And when, when oxi oxygen hits the flesh over time, it causes it to brown. And so there's a couple ways you can keep it from turning brown. And the other, the ones that were already in here, what I had put on them was a little bit of olive oil to seal the avocado from the oxygen. The other thing you can do is to apply acid. So lemon juice, lime juice, vinegar, all of those will help keep them from oxidizing. The other thing that I should have shown you this that people do is, um, you know, if you happen to cut it open, leave the pit in, if you put the, the avocado back on, it kind of reseals it. Um, the other thing I have done, again, it's, a, it's about preventing the oxygen is if I use half and I have the other half, I'll spray it. I have some avocado oil that I've used before. You've seen me use it a little bit of avocado oil to, to kind of, again, create a layer between oxygen, the air, and the, and the avocado, and then I wrap it, and that makes a big difference. Have you ever heard of putting oil on the avocado skin? I've not heard of putting oil on the avocado skin. For me, it's really about trying to prevent the oxygen from getting on the avocado flesh. Um, okay, so let me do this. I'm gonna do this next round. Here's our tomato, and then we've shown you guys before. This is a vine ripe, um, again, if you can afford it, I highly recommend working with the small like whole farm tomatoes or vine ripe tomatoes because it's about flavor, right? Um, conventional tomatoes are great, you know, and they're, they're great prices, but you're gonna get less flavor versus something like this. And that's why I'll use this. Is a, this is a local vine ripe tomato. And you can see that it's much riper. This happens to be like juicier. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and cut the core out real quick. 
happens if you cut into an avocado and it's not quite ripe? Do you Good put it yeah. back together? I've tried before and sometimes you can get it to work to come soften, but most times once you cut into the avocado, it is what it is. And so you really, the key is make sure that when you're gonna cut into the avocado, it has that give, then you're gonna be okay. Um, we're gonna go dice this. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, if I think about this size, I'm gonna cut it into fourths. So if I think about half and one third and half, 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 right? So if you would envision that's a half there, I'm gonna go down here down here, down here, and then we're gonna go, think about this half here, I'm gonna, I'm trying to keep a relative uniform dice, and I'm trying to keep relative size to my avocado as well. One, two, three, and then one, two, three. Someone, uh, by the way, had asked in the in the past, like what kind of knives I use. I'll use different knives in the different classes we do. I do, these are Shun knives that I use a lot and they are a premium knife and I really enjoy using them. As you can see, it's almost like, um, you see that kind of like, I don't know, that grain here. These are hand hammered and they're like made like samurai knives and they're really sharp from Japan. Um, but there are a lot of really good knives out there. You don't have to spend a ton of money. Like, you know, a brand that I, I started cooking with was was called Victorinox, same guys that make Swiss Army knives, Swiss company, very affordable knives that we all use. A lot of nice German knives out there, Wusthof and Henkel make good knives and you can get them in good equipment stores. Russell Dexter makes a very affordable knife. Um, so there are a lot of good companies out there that make knives. Um, but I think when you start to cook a lot, then you start to like collect knives and it's just fun to, they all feel a little bit different. So that's what we work with. Um, okay, so we've got avocado, we've got tomato here, and now we're gonna put the corn in here. This is fresh corn. I just quickly blanched it. Um, and the question you might ask is, well, why can I use frozen or can? You totally can, but it's, again, when we cook, it's about flavor. And so I'm trying to find something that's at its peak, and this is at its peak. So we're gonna cut the corn and we're gonna put it in the salad here. What I wanna show you here, so if you really, really want to go all the way on corn, and this is what we used to do in restaurants, is you'll take your knife and you'll slice down the middle of the kernels like this. And by doing that, you're allowing the juices and the flavor of the corn kernels to come out when you make your salad or when you saute. And these, you know, you ask yourself, you might ask yourself, well, what am I getting more than when I go to a restaurant versus maybe doing it at home? And one of the things that you get when you go to a restaurant versus doing it at home is we'll go through that distance. I'll have someone literally take every corn here and do that so that I can make sure that you have a great eating experience. So now you can do this at home. Okay, you're gonna, we're gonna cut off the kernels and already I can feel the juices, you can see them coming out. You're gonna cut your, you're gonna run your knife down the, the kernel and you, you'll feel the, the cob kind of like pushing up against the blade, which tells you where you need to stop. And so we're gonna cut all this down. And then this is what's gonna go into the salad. Now, what we do in restaurants is, you know, there is a lot of flavor in here. And so what I typically would do is save those, those the, the corn cobs and I would make stock with them. Or if I was gonna make chowder with them, I could use these for, to get additional flavor. Um, I'm gonna just keep going here. I'm not gonna cut through all the kernels because I'm just trying to do this quickly. But if you wanted to go the distance, I just wanted to show you as an example what you could do. Can you score the raw cob before cooking to bring out the flavor? I would not do that. And here's the thing: it's if you if you if you score the cob before you cook it, what happens is when you put it in. Well, even if you grill it, if you once you put it on the grill, or if you put it in the water, you boil it because you've punctured the skin, all the juices will start to come out. And what happens is then it comes out in the water or it goes, drips into the grill and then you don't get it in here. So right now it's still all in the kernel, right? Now I'm scoring it and trying to preserve as much as I can before it goes in the salad. If you go to the store and the husk is still on the corn, how can you tell it at its peak? Okay. Uh, so yeah, what you want to look for is you want to start, you first look at the husk. 
If the husk looks really fresh and green, like, like, a nice, like lettuce or salad, that's an indicator that the, the corn is fresh. If the husk is wilted and dried out looking and petrified, that's an indication that it's also um, starting to not, it's starting to be kind of old. You also want to look, you will look at the cut pieces here. If there's a cut here, if it looks really dried out, that's an indication that it's old. And even the edges here, as corn gets old, produce gets old, it tends to, it dries out and the moisture comes out. And that's what causes it, to, that, that shows you age. So if it's fresh, it's going to be very plump. It's going to be very green. And that's kind of what you're looking for in, in fresh, the, the freshest corn that you can get. So let me cut this off here real quick. Trim those pieces here. We'll get them in the salad. And then we're gonna add a few more flavoring, flavoring touches to the salad and we'll have our slaw and we'll have the salad done. Our barbecue sauce is almost done. So we're actually very close to bringing the whole dish together. Um, as we're kind of like starting to get close to wrapping, are there, you know, if there are any other questions that you folks have, Please, please go ahead and shoot them to us so we can get them all addressed um, in time. So we've got corn, we've got our avocado, tomato. I'm gonna add lime juice. And again, I'm rolling the lime because I really wanna soften it up, okay? It's very soft. You see that I can really push it. So it's all this juice now is just in this little pouch. See how soft that is? Can you remind us again, you were cutting the corn right in the middle of each kernel or were you cutting along the line? The I was kernel? cutting it right down the, in the middle of the kernel. Yeah, so, so if you were envision this as being the kernel, I was going right down that middle. I'm splitting the kernel open so that I can get the juice out. If I was, so I'm trying to take that, if you think of this as the kernel, right? I was cutting it right down the half so that all that juice can start to come out. We're gonna add some lime. If you have extra avocado, can you freeze it? Can freeze it, yeah, totally freeze it. How do you freeze it? After you cut it? Yeah, I mean, I've not, I don't, I don't freeze avocado, but frozen avocado is a really big industry these days. So what I would do is I would, you know, I would cut them and, Depends on what you want to do, right? If you're not sure what you want to do with them, like let's say you like to make sushi and you, you got like to slice them. So I would scoop them out as halves. I might put a little bit of lemon juice on them to like keep them from browning and freeze them as halves. But if I'm going to make guacamole and stuff like that, I would probably dice them all up, maybe toss them with a little bit of olive oil and a little bit of lime juice and then freeze them like that. Um, typically, if you're, if you're looking at, if you go and find in supermarkets in our stores, if you look at, the frozen product that we sell, there's usually citric acid on them. And that citric acid is like lemon juice or lime juice, which helps keep them from oxidizing. So that's how I would approach it. Okay, so I've got our lime juice in here. We're gonna put some olive oil. Would you recommend a replacement if you don't like raw tomato? Yeah, just don't make the salad. Uh, <laughs> you, can, you can leave it out. I, I made a salad similar, I was practicing this weekend. Um, and I didn't have tomato, but I used black beans. So, I mean, think about this as kind of like a salsa or a, you know, and so you can leave the tomatoes out. You can put, you can, you can do, you can make this with avocado, black beans, corn. You can make it without the corn. Um, I think tomato makes it great. It makes it really delicious, but you can do this without, and you still can come out with a very delicious dish. Might be interesting, you know, if you, uh, I know everyone has a watermelon for this weekend, right? Fourth of July. Take all the red part, eat that, take the rind, dice that up, throw this, throw it inside here. That'd be really interesting because in Southern cuisine, they like pickle watermelon rind. Um, and as I think about the, the, the rind, it has a cucumber essence. And so that would be really cool in here. And to that point, you could put cucumber in here too and that make a good salad instead of the tomato. All right, so we have um, cilantro. We'll put some in there. And again, these stems, the tender stems are totally fine to use. I'm gonna bunch it up real quick, roll it up, take my knife in here, just go through one time. You want it a rough chop. And this is one of those, you know, cilantro is kind of like a love-hate, right? If you don't like cilantro, that's okay, don't put it in. 
Um, what you could put in here instead of cilantro, or you could put both actually, is um, cumin. Cumin would make this really nice. Good replacement for cilantro. Parsley would work, basil would work too. Um, if you just don't like that pungent flavor, you'd be fine. Okay, garlic. We're gonna go ahead and cut the ends off again, the stems. We're gonna do a quick chop on this one here. Use my cleaver. Break it down. Chop. Keep, like if you have leftover yeah salad actually both of these would actually last quite a while this one here um if you're because you're adding the olive oil and you're adding the acid in here and you mix it together really well you could get i don't know three four days on this really easily so like make a big batch this week uh early in the week be perfectly fine throughout the weekend as long as you're keeping it sealed and you have a good amount of acid and a good amount of of, of olive oil or fat on there to coat the, the dish. And of course, making sure that you're keeping it at the safe temperature, right? So making sure it's refrigerated or if it's in a cooler, it's, it's packed in ice. As long as you keep those things sacred, it'll last quite a while. So I'm gonna mix this and you don't wanna mash this all up. I mean, if you want to make sort of a guac style, you can, but one of the things that you wanna do when you're, when you're working with mixing these kinds of dishes is I work around the edge. And one thing I am gonna put in here, which I did not put in here, is some salt and pepper. We're gonna go ahead and season this. Get that in there. But it's really coming together nicely. You can smell the cilantro, Chinese parsley. You can smell the lime juice. I, I want a little bit more shine. I'm gonna put a little bit of more olive oil in here. We're gonna go and kind of like mix this all together, get it all coming, get it all nice. And this is really, really looking good. I, I think it would really be nice if, if you have black beans, you know, that would really help uh, kind of like add some color, it would add some texture, it would add some bulk to this, it would make it nice. So if you have black beans, you could totally do that. Um, so you have, we have our two salads. I'm gonna go, so our viewer that was asking about tasting, I am gonna go ahead and taste these now to make sure that the seasoning is right. So I'm gonna go in here and taste the salsa here. I'm looking for good acidity, lime juice, all the herbs. I'm making sure that there's a nice seasoning here. And it's really coming together nicely. The acidity is really nice. We'll go ahead and try the, um, the slaw here. And what I like about this is it's not thick. The, there's a light sweetness on there. You can taste the sesame seed. It's coming, it's really, really refreshing. And sometimes people, you know, when they're cooking, they put too much of the, the, the mayonnaise that becomes very heavy, but this is bright. And when you're cooking, you want to balance between the creaminess and the bright acidity and just the hint of sweetness. So I think these are looking good. I'm going to bring the other dishes to the front and then we're going to plate one. And then uh, we'll, if there are any other last questions, we'll answer them and then we'll, we'll call it a day. So we're almost done. If someone is allergic to corn, what would be a good substitute? So if you're allergic to corn, one thing you could do is keep it out. Um, but when you think about the characteristics of corn and what corn adds to the dish, it's really adding, um, it's adding sweetness, it's adding herbaceousness, it's adding some of that vegetal quality. So the kinds of things that I would, would recommend substituting um, could be something like pineapple. So you could take pineapple and grill it or char it or roast it, which would add a nice kind of a bright sweetness to there. Um, you know, if you really want to get out there, peaches could be really, really cool. Um, so you want to find something that adds a nice kind of a, a hint of sweetness to this particular application. That said, you could leave the corn out too, and then you just have sort of almost like a a riff on a guacamole pico de gallo in this salad here. And then if you added the black beans, you'd be good too. 
I mean, one would be one thing would be cool. It'd be a little bit of a different direction. Would be to add something like chipotles, which would give it a really nice smoky quality to it, or roasted peppers. So it changes the dish, but you still have a very delicious dish. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna bring this all together. We've got our sauce here. Let me taste that real quick. Um, and I'm looking for this. What I'm looking for here, look at the consistency of that. Nice like barbecue sauce, really good barbecue um, color. Um, I want some brightness. I want some of that, that really kind of like fermented-ish flavor from the shoyu and the hoisin. I want sweetness. I want to taste the ketchup. Um, but I want it to be, I want my taste buds. I want everyone to imagine right now putting lihing mui in your mouth. I want that experience when I taste this. I want you to, the, the salivary glands to be like jumping when you taste this. And I cannot talk right now because my it's, it's like literally I got to swallow. So it totally did that. That's what you want. Okay. So we're going to bring this together. We're going to put a little bit on the plate. This is your side dish. Okay. Great color, texture, creaminess, crispiness from the corn. And then we're going to put, of course, we want, this is all local style, right? So we're going to go some. Hawaiian style, right, King's Hawaiian. Some sweet bread rolls. I wanna go ahead and put that on the plate here. Now, you, what you can do is if you want, you can mix a sauce together. But what I like to do is keep it separate because I want, I like people, to, I like to give people sort of the control of how much, how much or how little they wanna put on here. Okay, so we're gonna put some, a nice mound on there. Then we're gonna get some of the sauce here. We're gonna put it like right there. Look at the shine. Look at that happy shine. If you really wanna get decadent, you could maybe add some cheese to that, some grated cheese. But I think it looks really good like this. Sometimes the simple things are good. Now, you can do one of two things. And I, and I, I have a space here. I wanna show you there's two things you could do. One would be to go like that, right? So you have two sides and a sandwich, or you could do this, right? You can put this on top and have a killer sandwich. You can go one of two ways, but here you go. This is a really nice 4th of July, easy meal to put together. It's great to add to the grilling. You don't have to do the grilling and get all smoky. You can have someone else do that. You can bring this, you're adding this to the family style. If you're doing a small group, you know, you kind of like not want to get out here to the bigger crowds. Perfect thing to do with, you know, just the pod that you're hanging out with. Um, but again, you could take this by itself to a party. You could take this by itself to the party, take it with some tortilla chips, really, really delicious. Or you could just do this by itself too. So here are the dishes um, that we've done tonight. I hope you guys had fun. I hope you learned something. Um, any last questions that we want to answer? No? Well, uh, I hope you guys had fun. You know, next week we're trying to think about what we're going to do. We thought we'd, we'd, we'd want to go back to some, some real local style stuff. So I'm going to go look for some island fish. We'll do some fried local style fish. We're going to bust out um, some garlic salt. You know, we're going to go, I'm going to go throw back to the Harry Kojima from Let's Go Fishing. We'll do some fried fish. Um, but then I'll show you guys how to make sort of a ginger scallion pesto that's good for the fish but really is like something you could use for making like your own, your own ginger chicken at home. So simple dishes, really fun, really great with rice. And we'll see you next week.